I mean, a lot of people go to jail, few write books. How right. did you how did you do that? It's a great story. So believe it or not, when I go to jail, right? How old are you? Uh, let's see, so I was uh, 41 years old, 42. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. It's a terrible time to go to jail, right? I lost everything, right? Um, and I kids? go, well, I had two kids at the time, yeah, which was breaking the news to them was the most heartbreaking thing ever. I mean, like, literally, it was like a, too much crying, and then you go, I still get emotional about it, right? I bet. And I had to tell them, like, you know, daddy made mistakes, and now he's in the you know, hysterical. They were 11 and 9 at the time, right? So, um, I go to jail, and it's not the worst jail in the world. I'm not worried about slipping in the shower. So it's like a minimum yeah. security, but jail sucks, right? Who's my bunkmate? Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. What was he doing there? So he's there for selling, not marijuana, oh, but- bongs. Bongs. It was the most ridiculous thing ever. So he's doing a year and a day, a year and a day, for selling bongs. I'm like, shit, I'm like, he's doing a year and a day for bongs. I should probably get 3,000 years for bongs. <laughs> compared, compared to how, long did, how long were you serving? I had 22 months, yeah. right? So he's there for a year and a day. And, you know, the first few days, you know, there's not much to see. You just tell each other stories. And I'm telling him stories about my life, the insanity. And Did you know who he was? Of course. Yeah, they put us together. We shared a, we shared a cell. Yeah. Because I think we were both high profile. So they just put us together, right? So they could watch us both at once, right? And so we're... in jail, as in normal life, all the famous people know each other. Basically, right? Yeah. So and he's, a great, he's a great guy. And he was, he was writing a book at the time. And I'm telling him stories. And he's just rolling, he's just laughing hysterically every night, right? And the third night, he's like, you know, I thought you were making this shit up. But my wife Googled you, and it's like all true. In fact, your sister uh, know, knows you from my father from back in the day. He was a friend of mine, right? He's like, this is, you actually sank the boat. You crashed these cars. You did all this insane. You made all this money and all these drugs. He goes, you have to write a book. And I'm like, really? You think my life's exciting? Like, because it's your life, no matter how crazy your life is, it's yours. You don't of think, course. right? You think it's just normal. I'm like, he's like, I'm Tommy Chong. I think your life is just insane. He goes, write a book. So I, I started trying to write, and I was a terrible writer. Terrible. I couldn't write anything. I'd never written before like that, you know? So after like a month, I'm like, oh, this is just not working. I'm, I go to the prison library, and I stumble upon a book called Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe. Of course. I pick up this book, and I'm like, oh, my God. I want to write like this. So I, I plowed through the book, and then I, I started again with the yellow highlight, and I used this book like a textbook, and I taught myself to write by modeling Tom Wolfe. So it's like I had a model now, and I spent about three months just every, I mean, every metaphor, how he used grammar, how he described locations, how he used conflict. And I really started to see my writing dramatically improve. So I wrote about 100 pages when I was in jail, and then I ripped them up. I didn't think they were good enough. I got out of jail with no pages, but I had a skill now, right? So when I got out, I was like, you know, I don't know what to do with my life. And I was like, maybe I'll just start trying to write again, right? So I wrote about 12 pages, and I'm like, Wow, I think those are really good. Like, I thought they were pretty good, and I hate my own writing always, right? It's like when you write, you're, it's very, you're like, you always hate what you write, right? So I'm like, I think this is pretty good. I sent it to a few friends, and they're like laughing, like, oh my God, it's the funny. I'm like, really? So I sent it to a book agent. I knew very casually, just a casual friend, right? So I call him and say, I want to, you know, write a book. He goes, oh, great, let's get you a ghostwriter. I said, well, I want to write myself. He goes, can you write? I'm like, I'll send you the pages. I sent him 12 pages. Next day, he calls me back. He goes, did you pay Tom Wolf to write those pages? It was like that close to Tom Wolfe's voice, my first draft, right? I'm like, no, no, I wrote it myself. He's like, it's really good. He goes like, write 10 more pages. So I said, all right. So it took, about a, it took me a week to write 10 more pages. I wrote another 10 pages. I sent him the pages. 15 minutes later, he calls, he goes, stop everything you're doing. You have no idea what's about to happen to your life. This book is gonna be a master hit, master hit. I'm gonna get a movie made about this. We're gonna get Leo DiCaprio to play you, right? I mean, right from the start. Right? I was like, I thought he was delusional, right? But I didn't have much going on back then, right? So I was like, screw it. So I you know, hold up and literally I had a little tiny apartment and I spent one year just like doing 18 hours a day writing the book, The Wolf of Wall Street, right? About on page 60, he took it down to Random House who bought the book. I got a nice advance so I could at least live, right? And then when the book was finished about a year later, it went through seven edits because I overwrote it. Got it from a thousand pages down to 500 pages. And then when it was still a manuscript, it became a bidding war between Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, so it, was, it wasn't even a book yet. Amazing. I know, it was crazy, right? And then, you know, Leo brought in Scorsese, and I would love Leo, so I sold to Leo and Scorsese after a nice bidding war. And so began, you know, the story of The Wolf of Wall Street, what happened with the movie. And then there was a delay, by the way, for five years, because that was 2007. And then the writer's strike hit, and it got delayed which ended up being a great thing. And this is really empowering for all, all the listeners. I'll tell you why. Because when, I, when they wrote the, the script, when the script was done, 
by a guy named Terry Winter, who adopted the book. He did an incredible job. The first draft of the script was amazing, right? But it ended with me in jail. Like, because I went to jail and got out, right? And that was the ending of the movie, of the script, right? There was this delay then for four years after the writer's strike. And during those four years, I got very wealthy again, going out there and speaking and training entrepreneurs and teaching sales, right? So finally, four years later, when Leo called me, goes, we're ready to go. He came back to my new house. I was living in a mansion on the water. He's like, what the hell happened to you? Like in four years, I was in a tiny apartment, now into a very nice house again. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing this stuff around the world. And I showed him my clips from live on stage. And he's like, wait till Marty sees this. He's gonna go crazy. They rewrote the third act of the movie and made it a comeback story. So Amazing. that, yes, yeah, so I kind of rewrote my life story. When were you happier at the peak of your success, pre-conviction or on the comeback? Comeback. I was yeah. never happy before. Why? Number one, I was a massive drug addiction. Yeah. Like, well, I'm literally massive drug addiction. What you know? were you using? Quaaludes and cocaine. Quaaludes? Quaaludes, yeah. Is this the 70s? 70s. Well, you know, I, I, they Where'd were, you get quaaludes? I'll tell you how. So we, when I got really wealthy, you know, they made them illegal in the United States. Yeah, so, right? like a long time but, ago. But in Switzerland and Italy and Spain, so we were going country to country and like buying out the pharmacies of all the loots from overseas and bringing them back into the United States, just not to sell them, just to take them, just to eat them all. So we weren't dealing them, just consuming massive quantities of these quaaludes, right? And I got so wildly, I mean, I was taking about yeah. 10, 12 a day. You get very dead. Yeah, yeah. And like one of them would knock out a 200 pound Navy SEAL for eight yeah. hours. I would take four and walk around. Like, what, so what was the appeal of that? You know, um, euphoria, the yeah. incredibly euphoric, they get this like, the t first is you get this tingle phase and then you get like the slurs and the happy <laughs> drool phase, you get to the drool phase. And anyway, it's incredibly euphoric. And then I said, well, I'm What's getting... the drool phase like? The drool phase is when you're like drooling as you're talking, but you're like, well, drooling's not a big deal. Babies drool, I drool, <laughs> you know? And when you're slurring, you're like, baby slur, I slur. It's always a justification. But then the problem is, is the fourth phase is unconscious. <laughs> baby <laughs> drool. That's a great, that's the best justification. But, but, but phase heard. four though is, is unconsciousness, which is the problem. So the, what do you do then? Well, a responsible drug act will then take cocaine to make sure you don't go into the course, right? So I started to balance it out. The yin and the yang, come on. Cocaine, which is great, works great. The problem is cocaine makes you anxious. So I needed Xanax to get rid of the anxiety, right? So I would take Xanax to quell the anxiety, but then I still needed something to kick me over the edge with sleeping. So I took some Ambien to sleep and then some morphine for the pain I had. And before I knew it, I was taking 22 drugs at the same time. It was like a human Petri dish, right? And I was just incredibly high all the time lucky and running all, I know I'm very lucky I know I don't you know I always wonder why I didn't have any permanent damage yeah right and I think most of it was not a big drinker and I think alcohol is like that wild card alcohol and quails kill you yeah it's a, it's a wild card it's like gasoline on the fire so um, I was very fortunate I got sober in 97 how went to rehab I went to rehab I got sober. what's withdrawal like from quails not bad. It wasn't that bad. You know, it, it, for me, it wasn't so much withdrawal was the problem. It was more like just, I needed like a, an adult time out. I needed, I was so done with it. Like, I think, you know, people can get sober in rehab. People can get sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You can get sober anywhere, but you have to be ready to get sober. Yeah. You, if you're not ready, right? You could be in the world's greatest rehab and you'll just relapse. You'll run out, you'll climb over the wall. As soon as you got, you'll use again. Of course. I was done. I, I, I was I, like, my life was so out of control. I had my kids were starting to get older now, they're four and, and five years old. So I was like, I gotta end this. So I know I was very happy to stop using drugs. When young hear people say the news is full of lies. Some Kennedy's motorcade. 239 killed the death of Jeffrey Epstein.